So what we're going to be talking about here today uh, is how to quickly implement a machine tending solution. This is a short presentation. Use a cobot, right? Uh, any questions? All right. So, but that little diversion was just to give you the disclaimer. Um, we're going to be talking about cobots a lot. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if, if your applications need superhuman capability, so if you have heavy payloads, right, like more than a person can comfortably be picking up all day, or super fast speeds, um, a cobot's probably not right, but typically machine tending specifically tends to be human tended. Uh, and it's not something, if it's being done manually and you want to replace it with a robot, a cobot's usually the quickest way to get in there. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about cobots a lot. So with that out of the way, let's talk about how to quickly deploy a machine tending solution. Uh, as always, the agenda, we'll talk about what does machine tending actually mean. Uh, what are the elements in a machine tending solution? Uh, what does quick deployment mean, right? So when you need quick deployment, why you need it, uh, and how to implement it, and what solutions are out there uh, on the market today, as well as we'll kind of summarize what we covered. Machine tending, um, it's exactly what it sounds like. Does anyone not have any exposure to machine tending? Um, that's pretty much what I thought. Whenever people think of adding a, a robot or specifically a collaborative robot to something, machine tending is one of the first things that people think of, right? The other being simple pick and place. Uh, but machine, machine tending is part of that category of applications, but it's slightly more specific, right? So it's, it's a robot or but basically your process is taking apart, putting it into a process, waiting for that process to complete, and then removing the part, and then loading the next one. So it's it's a pretty simple flow of operations, but it can it can branch out and get pretty complex. Uh, the part handling, for the most part, tends to be pretty simple. The process is extremely easy to document, you know, flow chart out. Even the solution, you can visualize it in your head, almost everything it can take uh, before we ever have a conversation about robots. The hard part tends to be communicating between machines and robots. Um, you know, the, the machine says, okay, I'm ready for this part to be unloaded. Robot acknowledges all those little signals and handshakes that happen tend to be the most involved part of machine tending application. That's not considering any custom end effector design that's needed, um, but that tends to be the first roadblock. The typical machine tending process, uh, like I said, it's pretty simple and it flows pretty linearly. Uh, the part, you pick it up from the end feed, right? So say we have a machine tending solution set up here. You pick up the part, you put it into the machine, you send an OK signal to the machine, right? So whether your operator pushes a button now, whether you want to have your robot physically push the button, which we'll skip ahead, but a robot pushing the button is a pretty easy way to implement that OK signal. Uh, then you wait for your machining process to finish, and you pick up the part from your process, and then you place the part in the outfit. And then the cycle, as far as the robot or the, your tending process is concerned, that just repeats all day, every day. Uh, we'll talk more about part pickup. That's one of the key elements in any robot application. Uh, and while you're waiting for your machining process to complete, a robot can just sit there idle, or it can be doing other things. Like maybe maybe you have a QC process, or maybe it's queuing up the next part. If you have a dual end effector with two grippers on it, maybe while that process is going on, it's going and grabbing the next part, and that shaves off the cycle time, right? Uh, between this, sequentially, you can also add another node a lot of times, or another step. Uh, if your QC needs to happen in a certain place, this is usually where it happens. So before you place the part in the outfeed, the outfeed might be an accepted parts bin and a reject bin, and the robot does some sort of QC process uh, between picking up the part and then putting it in the outfeed. 
Uh, some examples of cobots being used for machine tending. This is a pretty cool one. Voodoo Manufacturing up in, I think they're in Boston. Uh, anyone feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. They're a, a pretty large scale 3D printing lab, meaning they have dozens and dozens of 3D printing bays in their shop. And a 3D printer needs to have a, a fresh platter inserted into it for the print job to happen on, and then that platter needs to be removed and offloaded somewhere. So they were doing that uh, manually for a long time. Adding a cobot allowed them to run all night, and they basically tripled their production uh, by automating it. Panther Global. Uh, they had a process, it's not, so this is interesting because it's not quite a machine tending process, but they're taking steel shafts and doing a hardening process. So they put it into a, a temperature controlled like a bat so that the parts uh, go through some surface hardening. This is another cobot, but you'll notice it has a suit on it, right? Why is that? Heat, chemicals, right? Well, how pleasant do you think that job was for a person? It sucks, right? Um, so they were having trouble finding people or getting people to stay. The official description was that this is the job that the newest employee that they had would have to do. So this went to the, the lowest person on the totem pole. It was that bad. So they automated it. Um, they got you know the benefits of a machine tending solution, but the biggest benefit was that people weren't being burned out from doing this horrible, dirty, dangerous job all day. Uh, and then Walt Machine is a pretty pretty well-known example. Uh, there's been several articles written about it. He's a small machine shop. Uh, I think it was his dad's machine shop, and, and Tommy Coffee runs it now. Uh, he, he got this big job to make these camera housings, and it was way bigger than anything they'd ever done before. They're a small machine shop. They don't have a lot of automation besides the CNC machines themselves. So with a cobot, he was able to convert his machining process from one shift to 24 hours. So he was able to meet the, I think his throughput requirement was like 2x plus of what he was used to running. So with a cobot and being able to run lights out, he was able to meet the throughput demands. So with those examples, we gave you, you know, why those use cases found benefit from a cobot. But why would you bother automating a machine tending process in the first place? Well, one of them I kind of touched on, finding good people is hard right now, right? I think you guys were in my last presentation and I saw a lot of nods when I asked if people were having trouble finding good employees. Uh, any employee eventually gets sick, has to take a break, uh, can't work for whatever reason. Either they're sick or they get injured, um, taking breaks. Not in the same category as getting sick or injured, but you know, people need to take breaks. Uh, they need food, so they need to take a lunch break, right? A robot tending machine, you're no longer reliant on finding an employee to do a task, right? So it's a buffer against turnover for a process. It removes people from that dull, dirty, dangerous work. Three Ds is the mnemonic uh, that we used to remember that. Dull, dirty, dangerous. People don't like doing that. They're not fulfilling jobs. I don't know if anyone here would love to go in and do this for eight hours and then do that every day, um, but I think most people do not enjoy that kind of work. So this allows that person to be repurposed into something that adds more value and, and uses that human skill a little bit better. A robot never takes breaks. It doesn't need lunch. Um, it doesn't need to take lunch breaks, gossip breaks, bathroom breaks, whatever. It just doesn't need to take breaks. It does the exact same thing every single time, all day long, at the exact same speed, right? Um, so that's why you may want to automate a machine tending solution in the first place. Uh, now, if you want to do this, what are some of the things you need to think about? I'm a fan of putting things in table. We won't run through this bullet by bullet, don't worry. Uh, but some of the things include, you know, the robot itself, right? What, what kind of reach payload uh, requirements do you have? Uh, the gripper, do you want just one gripper on the end of a robot? Or like the, the example I mentioned earlier, do you want two grippers? So while the process is going on, you can queue up the next part, and when the robot reaches into the machine, it 
picks up the part and loads the next part, and you eliminate a lot of movement there. Uh, do you want a vacuum cup, uh, some kind of complicated actuator? What are your air and electrical requirements for the robot, and what do you have? So do you have a power drop like this coming down from the ceiling kind of nearby? These cobots, by the way, run on just a standard wall outlet, so it's not, you don't need to add a ton of uh, power infrastructure. Uh, what's your PSI requirement? Does your end effector need, you know, controlled air, certain humidity, certain cleanliness, all things to kind of keep in mind? Controls and PLC, we're not going to get into this, but don't forget to talk about that, right? Whenever you're, or don't forget to consider what your machine is capable of versus what the robot's capable of. They need to be able to talk easily, right? Uh, safety. That one point is in orange. Uh, risk assessments are required for any robot app, right? A collaborative robot, the nice thing about it is it fits 80% maybe of that puzzle. Uh, but my classic example is if you put a chainsaw on the end of the robot, it doesn't matter if the robot stops if it hits somebody, right? You're still going to cut someone in half. Sorry for the graphic example there. but. The point there is that your the robot is collaborative, but your application needs to be collaborative. So that's why we recommend the risk assessment. Um, yeah, safety light curtains, area scanners. That's an area scanner right there. Um, if you guys have been seeing that robot move, an area scanner lets you define zones so that when you get close to it and cross one zone, the robot slows down. When you get even closer, the robot can stop. So an area scanner gives you kind of more than collision detection, it gives you predictive capabilities on what to do with your robot based on what's around it. Uh, what kind of footprint or layout can you accommodate? Is your machine tending, or is your machine around a bunch of tables uh, and your foot space is limited? Well, if you don't have space for guarding, that's another reason why collaborative robots are a pretty quick way to get into this. Um, and where are you going to put, where are you going to present parts from, and where are you going to feed parts out to, right? So footprint layout, always a good idea to have this under control. Part presentation, there's so many ways to do this. Um, I know some of you guys were here yesterday when I kind of covered the different ways to present parts. In a nutshell, this is how do you make sure the robot can actually pick up your parts every cycle? There's a lot of ways to do this. There's a lot of very creative solutions to help people present parts. You can use 2D vision. You can use jigs or fixturing, nested trays. Um, this is basically limited by your creativity uh, and how, how much you want to overhaul the process. Um, and then your process elements. Uh, we've talked about the actual automation. We don't need to go too much into detail, I think everyone has a pretty good idea of what these mean. Um, a lot of times, I will comment on throughput, a lot of times what people find, even if they their intention to automate a solution is to eliminate a person, but that's the, the stated reason. What we found historically is that automation allows them to repurpose that human worker into doing something else. So really, they're adding capacity to their plant. Uh, and of course, the robot, with just its sheer capability to work all day at the same pace, it adds throughput to that process. Even if the cycle time, a lot of times, with the robot is maybe a little slower than a person could do, the robot wins out in just sheer consistency over an eight-hour period. Uh, setup time, uh, how much time does it take when you roll a robot up to it? How much time does it take to set up and, and start your process? Changeover time, kind of related to setup time, but uh, changeover time almost never adds value, right? So changeover process, if you're switching over your machine from one product to another, changeover time is how much time it takes you to reconfigure it to run the next product, right? Uh, minimizing changeover, well, I'm going to harp on changeover a lot over the course of the day. If you have multiple products, changeover time is never part of your value stream, right? That's just pure non-value add. So minimizing that, if you're, as far as the economics of a machine tending solution go, minimizing your changeover time increases the ROI that you get eventually, and it speeds up how fast you pay the, how fast the system pays itself, pays for itself. Uh, and then the throughput yield. Uh, 
what's the percentage of good parts that a process produces, right? Typically due to the consistency of the robot, like I said, you see this go up because even if the robot's messing up parts in the beginning, it's very easy to tweak your process with the robot, and then once you have it tweaked, it'll be done the same way, right? So uh, robots typically increase the throughput yield. Financial elements, um, also probably pretty self-explanatory. I do see that a lot of people say, use these terms interchangeably which is fine because you find out very quickly which one they're actually referring to. Usually the return of an investment is calculated as simple ROI, meaning the gains minus the cost divided by the cost. That's just a simple ROI formula. Usually that's calculated by saying, okay, what do I pay a person as their hourly wage or their salary or whatever for every hour of work? And then I don't have to pay that, so that's my gain. The gains of a robot are typically far beyond that. Right, so that consistency, how far does your quality go up, right? One of the intangible effects of a robot or a cobot that we've seen is that it actually tends to boost morale, right? People get nervous, they think their jobs are being automated away. When the deployment actually happens, people actually are very welcoming of a cobot in their space. Uh, it's really, really, really common for the shop to name the robot and get very involved and interested. Um, so there's a lot, the simple ROI gains uh, go way beyond just the wage, right? Um, payback period, how long does it take to break even on an investment? Deployment time, okay, so you bought all this equipment. How long does it take until your process is actually up and running? and fully automated, right? That's something to take into consideration because you don't want to babysit a deployment for six months if you can help it, right? That's, that's all this time, that's all this opportunity cost that you're spending on this one solution that you could be doing other things with that time, right? Upfront cost is exactly what it sounds like. Labor rate and burn rate, this is a pretty good figure to know. This is not just the hourly wage of an employee that's doing a machine tending solution. This is how much does each hour of your production actually cost? So how much does it cost to have a person do a task for an hour? Um, just a quick overview of facility level elements from what I just described versus process level. The process level is all the elements of that one process, pretty self-explanatory, right? So at the process level, you have the robot itself. What are your considerations with the robot? How are you gonna present parts, controls, all that stuff? Uh, at the facility level, you're probably gonna wanna know more about safety. What's your footprint like? How much footprint can you spare to automate a solution? Air, electrical supply, do you need more infrastructure? Most people don't, uh, but you know, good to know ahead of time. Uh, what's your change over time, setup cost, ROI payback, all that stuff obviously concerns the entire facility. The more you know about these things before you pursue a machine tending solution, the more streamlined the overall process is going to be. And by process, I mean deploying a machine tending solution, right? Uh, and knowing these means knowing your constraints. So, Footprint layout, for example. If it's in a really constrained, or I don't want to overuse that word. If it's in a really tight area with a bunch of tables and parts and carts and people moving around everywhere, that's a constraint, right? Because now you only have so much footprint to work with. Um, controls PLC, if your machine doesn't support any kind of communication protocol and you're gonna have to do everything with discrete IO, running wires, that's another constraint, right? So knowing all these constraints ahead of time, speeds up how quickly you can deploy a machine tending solution because you don't get caught off guard right in the middle of deploying something and have to change gears in the middle. Uh, it streamlines it a lot. So, what are the actual things to look out for when quickly deploying? So, when is it important to quickly deploy a machine tending solution? Well, if you've got a high mix scenario, which is becoming more and more common, right? In a job shop, you're never gonna fully optimize any one process. So 
to automate something, it's important that you be able to take it down, move it, redeploy it somewhere, and it's important that that process of redeployment takes as little time as possible. That's really what makes or breaks an automation project in a high mix situation, right? If you tie, this all depends on your particular situation, but if you get a robot that's a single purpose and it does one task, right? If that's what it's intended for. In a high mix situation, that can be difficult to justify, right? Because it, it's either gonna be sitting idle or it's gonna take you forever to change it over for a new process. So if your automation, whatever that is, if you can redeploy it to multiple processes, suddenly it starts to make a lot more sense and it's a lot easier to justify, right? So how do you do this? One of the main tips is to get your operators involved. Um, process engineers tend to be super, super smart. They know the process, they know the math. Um, the engineering elements are definitely important, but your operators are gonna be the one that do the process every day, and they're gonna be the ones to tell you, hey, if I have a polishing process, the finish is never really right as it comes from upstream, so I always have to touch it up here. A subtle detail like that, believe it or not, can completely change an automation project. Um, so it's important to get your operators involved, if at all possible. Someone who knows the process, knows what tends to go wrong in real life, so to speak, out on the floor. Knowing your process, again, is extremely critical to successfully deploying automation. Uh, knowing your process makes it take a lot less time to get something up and running. Another how is redeployable. We already kind of talked about this. If you take a collaborative robot, that over there, that's a cobot on a mobile base. You can roll it around and either lag it into the floor or lower the feet. If you take a adaptive gripper like you see right here, that by itself gives you a lot of flexibility, right? That gripper has an 85 millimeter stroke and you can change out the fingers. So in terms of what parts you can grab, that's quite a bit, right? So if, if, if flexibility is your main need, consider something like that, because that can be re redeployed. You can just roll it up to a machine, run a program uh, with minimal change. And focus on the ease of use, right? So if you don't need, if you have a system that's easily programmable, suddenly you don't need an engineer or a programming expert or a robotics expert to actually initiate a new process on it, right? If your operators, remember how I said get your operators involved? That person who knows the process extremely well, if they're able to program the actual solution, that's a double win, right? Because number one, that's cheaper than engineering time or integrator time. Number two, that person knows the process, so they know exactly what to look out for as they're programming. They're not caught by any surprises. Uh, so that, in two ways, reduces your deployment time and cost. So what are the solutions for rapid, notice I said redeployment there, because that's one of the central uh, keys. Um, so like I said, Cobot, mobile platform, adaptive gripper. This gets you a lot of the way there. Uh, the UR platform has three sizes, three kilogram, five kilogram, and 10 kilogram, different reaches as well, depending on the size. For most applications for machine tending, you don't need any sort of guarding, which minimizes footprint, um, and they're extremely easy to program. If you guys have a chance to get your hands on these four robots here, they are there for you to basically explore the pendant, program some waypoints, uh, and check out the, the programming interface. I highly suggest you do so. Um, the adaptive gripper, like I said, it's an 85 millimeter stroke, but there's a bigger version with 140 millimeters, right? So that gets you most of the way to what most people think of when they think of a, a machine CNC part, right? Uh, you can control, it's servo driven, um, so it's electrical, but you can control the force position and the speed of opening or closing. Uh, and that is also easy to program. You can just program it straight from the teach pendant through a graphical interface. The mobile pedestal lets you take this wherever it needs to go. Um, everyone knows what a, what a mobile pedestal probably looks like. 
There's a couple of different versions of this. So we make a fixed height version. If you look over at that big uh, well fixturing table, uh, that's a fixed, that one's fixed to the floor, it's bolted in. That's pneumatically adjustable, so you can put air on that to act as a lift assist, so you can adjust the height of that. That particular pedestal is mobile and it's a fixed height. So it's just a simpler pedestal overall. Uh, either one get, gives you a lot of flexibility, um, certainly a lot more than picking up a robot and placing it somewhere. These things aren't that heavy, but if you can roll it, that's clearly the way to go. Um, something else that we have is, remember how I talked about communication to the machine. So the relay interconnect box, if you're in a situation where you have a lot of discrete digital I.O. or a lot of wires and they just send 24 volt signals one way or the other, excuse me, our relay interconnect box consolidates all of that if you attach one of these to each of your machines, right? So the box is made it up with a machine. All your signals are consolidated. And then all you need from your robot controller is one umbilical connection. So if you're deploying it to this machine one day, you plug it in here, all your signals are connected. You just run the program, all your I.O. is good to go. If you need to change it over into here, unplug one connection, move your robot, plug it in. So it consolidates. This also has all your safety relays and stuff built into it. Um, so it, it's quite a lot of connections that are consolidated in one, one cable. Uh, and then we have the Ready Robotics Taskmate. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen our Taskmate unit over there, but this is basically a all-in-one, like, pre-integrated Swiss Army knife type of solution, right? So it's got a lot of these features that are specifically designed to chip away at all the things that cause change over time, right? So Cobot, easy to deploy. You don't need a bunch of guarding. Um, the robot itself is 80% of the safety you need to work around humans. Uh, the TeachMate, it puts a nice little controller near the end of arm with buttons so you can open and close the gripper. If you guys are familiar with the UR, you know what free drive is, where you can move the robot by hand. Usually you need to hold down a button on the pendant or wire in your own button to activate free drive mode. TeachMate allows you to just toggle free drive instead of making it a momentary push button. So you can actually now use both hands to guide the robot with a little bit more control than holding a button with the other. They've got a really cool toolless quick change interface, which you guys can't see any of the tool flanges on these robots, but it's a four hole pattern. Are you guys familiar with um, like a vacuum connection where you've got two flange pipes and you have a clamp? It's similar to that, but basically without any tools, as long as you've got that flange interface on your tool, you can rigidly clamp it to the end of the robot without any tools in seconds, right? Uh, the R-Align is a pretty cool thing. It's a probe and socket system so that you can recalibrate all your waypoints in your program like that. So with the tool is quick change interface, that's already quick. The probe is fully constrained when you made it into the socket. And if you make all your waypoints relative to that, well, moving it from one machine, you run the recalibration process. It takes less than five minutes. There's an interface that walks you through exactly how to do it. Uh, there's no technical knowledge needed at all to do this. So it makes that recalibration of your program waypoints super, super quick. Uh, there's a PLC box similar to our interconnect box. This is for discrete I.O. So if you have a PLC box that's got all your connections pre-wired to your machine, it consolidates all that into one connection into the into the radio robotics unit or into the taskmate unit. Pneumatics similarly, they're pre-integrated, um, so all the pneumatic handling, the the distribution of your pneumatic power is all integrated into the base. And then they've got a custom software interface. You don't need to program through the robot pendant anymore. There's a custom interface that is built around the concept of ease of use. So even without training, I'm pretty confident most of you guys could go write a program uh, on this interface. Um, obviously with all these 
little features that make certain parts of deployment a little easier. It can be deployed up to 24 times faster uh, than an industrial robot to run a similar task. So with that plug section out of the way, uh, <laughs> let's talk, summarize what we've talked about. So again, cobots are really, really, really well suited to automating machine tending tasks. It's a task that's very intuitive for us to pick up. Humans are doing it all the time. Cobots are intended for, to replace human capability in this kind of task, right? One of the keys is to running a job shop or multiple processes. Minimizing change over time goes a long way uh, in making an automation solution viable. Getting your operators involved, I know that was one bullet point on the whole slide, but I can't overemphasize uh, how important that can be uh, and how much smoother that can make the process of deploying a robot if you get your operators involved early on. Know your process with as much detail as possible. Um, it is possible to know more than more detail than you need, but generally it still doesn't hurt uh, because even the smallest detail can be a huge thorn in your side. Uh, and then, you know, focus on flexible and redeployable automation uh, so that you can extract value out of, or you can minimize non-value add out of multiple processes rather than have a system sit there and be idle uh, while a different product is being run. So that's it for me. I think I'm doing pretty good at keeping these at 30 minutes, give or take a few. Are there any questions?